you want to begin tonight on how to be a blue teamer. So if you're in the CDC, self so coming one, or just doing one in the future, you want to know more about it, this should hopefully help a little bit at least. Is it too late to sign up for this one? Yeah, it's not too late at all. Cool. So if you have like no idea what's going on, like, how do you get started? Uh, I mean, that's kind of touched on it here. It's just kind of, we'll get through it if you have more questions. You can yell out stuff. I'm actually not in the one that's coming up. Is it next weekend? Like it's week? uh, next week. Saturday. Yeah. Like, Really, we can plan days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah, that's that time. Yeah, if you want, I can talk. Uh, I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. So, if you have specific questions, I may not be able to help, but you can still shout them out. So, what is the blue team? Blue team is basically what you would be doing as you sign up. You're the one responsible for getting the systems from the from ICA to the people that send it out, and you're responsible with securing it, figuring out what's wrong with it, making it work as it's meant to do, so following the scenario that's also given. Um, and then kind of making your own decisions, kind of partially open-ended, partially not open-ended. You need to adhere to the rules and what it should be doing, but at the same time you need to make sure that it's secure so when the red team is attacking it, um, they can't hopefully get the flags and the different things that they're trying to get. Um, so the red team is the ones attacking, you're the blue team that's securing it, and the green team is the ones that are testing to make sure it's actually usual and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so where do you even start? Uh, the first thing you want to do really is just kind of figure out what you need to do. So when you get the scenario, read it multiple times to make sure you really understand what each machine is supposed to do, what the, what the actual large scale system is doing. Uh, and from there you can kind of start to figure out what should be talking to what, or uh, why things need to have certain, certain ports open or what needs to communicate with different things. Uh, and from there you can get the network and figure out, kind of get a better picture. So this is just generic one. This isn't for anything specific. But you can start to look at it and say, okay, we have a database that has to talk to certain things, or we have backups, what do those need to look at, whereas when are users going to access those, and things like that, you just kind of start thinking about where, where those will be accessed and how so you can then move to securing it later on. Uh, you also, this will follow the scenarios, so you'll have specific IPs and things like that you need to set up. Um, but as far as securing the systems that they give you, so when you first get them, you want to First, just take a look at what, what's on them, what they're actually running, um, like operating system-wise, or different programs that are on there. And you can start to look at how, why they're outdated, what's wrong with them. So you want to update all the systems to the default and make sure that when you do these updates, whether it be a Windows machine or whatever it is, that you're actually installing into the most current and recent stuff, so it's actually well, it's passed from all known vulnerabilities, because that's mainly the stuff that was, would be in there from a severely outdated standpoint. It would be a thing that's not like something crazy. So updating your systems is kind of the first thing to do, and also changing the default credentials. A lot of them are just CDC, CDC or whatever it is that are given. Um, the red team knows that, so they know what the default thing is, or something that's easy to guess. So you can go in and change that. You should change that for basically all the users. Um, so that if they have access, they can just get them. Once you have those, you can start to look at what's actually running on the systems. So this could be like a process or a script that is put in there, like a backdoor from the Ice Age when they sent it out, and you'll want to basically clean up everything that's on there. So it could be a program on it that's actually, it's not what you think it is, it's like a different version, it's something that's insecure, so you'll want to look at what it's doing or what's open. So these are just a few different commands you can look at, different files you can look at to figure out if there is any of these backdoors or just something that shouldn't be there. Uh, and it can be kind of hard because maybe you don't know what actually should be in these files at first. So a lot of it, with the CDC when you're first looking at stuff is to figure out what is normal or what do you need and that's kind of sometimes the hard part is to say, do I need to kind of turn this port off, do I need this running? And to get by that it's just kind of looking it up, you can ask, they have like the lab jams, uh, I don't know when there is. Uh, Sunday nights and Wednesdays from 7 to 9 or yeah. 7 to 9. So those are really good times to go and ask like, this is what's running here, is this how it's supposed to work, is this what it's supposed to be, and they'll kind of guide you know, in ways. Um, so these ones here, just to talk about a couple, you can look at, um, like Netstat will show you all the different connections on there. So if you have some weird connection coming from some place you're not expecting, or something that's not in the scenario, then you can say that's not good. You should probably try and get rid of that, and track down where it's actually at. Uh, you can list the open files and things that are actually running on there and see if there's any thing that you're not expecting, basically. Um, you can look at the processes to see if there's any extra programs that may be opening a port or something like that. Um, the cron tab will show you if there's any like jobs or something that's gonna happen on like a daily or hourly, whatever it may be. Um, 
instance. So you may close something or shut something down, but the next day it's just going to pop back up and be there again. So that's somewhere to look if there's like a recurring thing that you keep seeing. Uh, and then batch RC and NC profiler spots that they can, something that's executed basically every time you would log in or every time it's booted up, and you can see if there's just something they added in there in the command that'll run something that you don't want. Uh, it's easy enough to just go in there and delete what shouldn't be there. And those are things that you could look up like an example of what should what it should look like. And you can say, why is this weird line in there that's doing something else? Uh, and then you can just get rid of that one and call it good. Um, so kind of also talking about securing the actual things that they give you. Uh, auditing the users and their permissions on the box. So these ones are kind of a little bit less clear at times. Uh, you might have different users and you know where they should be based on the scenario and what they should have access to specifically. So if you see that there is a file in there that anybody that's on the box can read, like if they can look at something that is specific to admins or some person that has a higher privilege but it's actually readable to everybody, and things like Etsy password groups, you can see if there's weird users that you actually don't need. Uh, and those could be someone that has like, a default password that you don't even realize is right there. Uh, basically, just making sure that if there's a semi-important file, so like in Etsy, if there's files that are there that are readable by everybody, you probably don't want that. You want to make sure it's locked down so only people that need access to certain things have access to them. Uh, and that'll be kind of clear by the scenario a little bit. Um, but also just kind of looking at it and thinking about, does this person actually need to be here to be able to execute this program? And if the answer is no, it's probably best to just not have that to have kind of least privilege um, in general. Uh, these are a couple of questions they have that can help kind of search through everything and find if there is like a buyer they're not expecting that have different permissions than you have had, so you can just run those basically. Uh, and that'll pop out and tell you if there is a specific directory or binary that's on the computer machine uh, that you're not expecting. That's something that you can track down and change. So those are kind of the what you should do when you get a box or machine and you want to make sure that it's secure from that standpoint. So like what did they do to make it insecure? Uh, another thing that's this is where it gets a little more open-ended when it's kind of how do you want to actually secure your network and your machines. Um, so you don't necessarily have to do all of these, but a lot of them will help make it harder for someone to attack like the red team or just make it easier to manage um, during the actual day of the CDC. So we'll talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. Um, making sure you can audit what needs to be public. So this kind of gets back to looking at the network and the, the internet up top is something that anybody can just access. So if you have like a website, it makes sense that that's accessible by the internet right? outside Places. But something like your database and your backups and things like that, you probably don't want that facing the internet. Uh, and that's because that just opens up possibilities for people to possibly break into them uh, or just do really access things that they don't need access to. So making sure that it's actually, the diagram actually looks how you want it to look and it's not like there's a line for this diagram from the backup that goes straight out to the internet that anybody can see. I mean, you should. You want to back up each system individually, but then also think as a whole network and kind of have another layer of making sure that even if they do have access to secure, but making sure that they don't have access to that machine is something you can try to help um, and mitigate any possible issues. Um, they give an example there um, about the FTP machine and having the users are already in the internal network so they can have access, but this shouldn't be on the public and that makes sense. Uh, another one checking for open ports. This kind of goes back to uh, when we're securing the actual machine. Uh, you can run tools like Nmap and different scanners and things like that to look at the machine. And you know, say maybe say, say this is the web server at the www box. Um, it makes sense that you would have port 80 open running HTTP. Or it makes sense that you have some ports open because you need to be running that uh, for the CDC. But then there might be a whole bunch of other ones you see or even this one at the bottom there. This one that's running HTTP and and next one there. So that's probably something you don't need just given that it's a high port number and not like a standard thing. That's probably something you don't need and also don't want just because it's something that's open to others to look at if they can find it. So that you can also run these scans to see what's going on and try to access any of them. So you can lock down these, close any port you don't need. It's kind of the, the best practice to make sure that you don't have an extra thing open that you don't need. Um, firewall, so it also helps. You can do it. 
is on each individual host or is the network in general. So each individual machine can limit what they're going to actually look at when the traffic is received by them. Um, or you can do it on the whole network, or you can do both. Um, so if it just, if you know you need, for this example, it's port 80, 25, and 1194. If you know you need those, you can set up a firewall that's the only thing, if ever, all the traffic has to go through this point, and you can say if it's not one of these ports that I know I need, just block it and don't let it go through because I'm not going to need it. So there's no need to get that kind of position to stop the risk towards your systems. Uh, and then if you do it on each individual post, that's another way that you can say that the WWW box only needs 80, for example, then you can just say only take 80 except for deny everything else. Uh, and that's just another way you can start to secure things and limit the traffic that's actually getting to your machines. You can also segment your network. This just basically means blocking it off even more. So in this example here, the backups in the database don't need to be seen by any user that's in the organization, whatever the scenario is. So you can have a segment off where a typical user, once they log into the network, they still can't see that stuff. As you can see, there's kind of a wall there, kind of segmented. Uh, that's another way you can limit, even if they are a user, if someone does gain access as a user, which ideally they wouldn't, but if they do, they still don't have access to everything, you know, the, the keys of the kingdom. Uh, which kind of gets into having user accounts on the system. There can be sometimes a lot of them, and ones you need to manage on each individual machine can get a bit not fun to do and really kind of tedious. So there's, there's ways to make it simpler, which is on the next slide. Um, but making sure that they only have access to what they need and it's not like they just have access to everything on a box or they're not on a box that they don't need is just an easy way to ensure that your, your systems are secure from a user standpoint, basically. So a way to have central authentication for all your users uh, is LDAP, and then you can basically hook all your different systems into this. Uh, I don't, sometimes you have to have it for, so you see set up this one. Yep, you are part of LDAP. Okay. So, in that case, you do need to have it set up, and it's usually a good thing to have anyway, so making sure that that's configured properly so that the users are actually in the groups they need and have access to what they need and don't have access to what they don't need uh, is something that you can do with this, and it's pretty, I mean, if you don't know how to do your network before, um, a lot of this stuff you can just look up on Google and try to find a video or something like that to learn it, uh, and that's kind of the best way because it's not really realistic or possible to know everything that could possibly be wrong with these machines. So it's a lot of learning on the fly. Maybe something doesn't look right, you want to learn more about it. So you can just go look it up online, or like the lab jams or another way you could try to learn more about it. Uh, but back to LDAP. So this makes it really easy if you need to get rid of a user or add a user, which a lot of times you'll have to do in the middle of the CDC, and you'll have a certain amount of time. Rather than going to each individual machine, if you go back to the network really quick, rather than going to each one of those individually and adding a user to it, you just add it in one place and then everything authenticates based on this central LDAP server. And then another thing, during the actual CDC, it's good to see what's happening on your network, being able to either have a visual or just some way to actually see what's happening rather than going to log files individually into the machine, which is never fun, because if someone does get a new machine, you can, if you know how they got it and what they did, you can get points back and basically just send a, like a little write-up of what happened or what you think happened. And having something like this is kind of a good way to do that. It'll report incidents and things that happened or unnatural things that happened on there. So this can be host-based, meaning it's for each individual one, or it can be the network base as a whole. Uh, there's a couple examples here of those. Uh, basically, it will give you something that looks nice, hopefully. And you can quickly and easily see something happen. There's a whole lot of traffic going to this machine, or something happened, someone logged in, someone was using a system here and you weren't expecting it. And it'll log all those, and the, the host-based ones can look at the log files specifically, or you can configure them to look at specific log files, so if it's running some web server or something like that, you can look at that log file and see what's actually happening if someone's trying to connect on your times, and you know that's not good, you can say someone's probably trying to attack that right now. So this is another one. Um, this would be the network-based one. You can see different events that happen. And these are just good ways that if something does happen during the actual competition, you can see um, what it might have been or where it was happening at least, which will give you a lot of information. And to set these up, a lot of it would be, if you haven't done it before, in fact, just using Google or looking up how to do it or asking people that have done it before, because um, it's not common sense and people just think, oh, I know 
project that we this before. Uh, and then one of the last things to do after you think your class is secure and set up properly is to kind of rent it yourself or to test your machines. So these are some tools that's the same Metasploit. You can set up kind of another machine that's on your network, basically like a that has these tools on it, and you can scan your machines to make sure that the ports you close are actually closed, there's nothing open, but that you can't do something, you can really just general scanners and things like that to make sure the way your tenant's secured is actually what you're seeing when you try to attack it. Uh, it's just a good way to test, to kind of double check everything you've done. Uh, and Bloodhound is specific for AD, which if it's in this one, it's uh, it basically goes through all the different relationships and things that could occur, different paths, kind of like a tree structure, um, and it'll tell you if there's something that you don't see. It might be kind of hard to see, not obvious, that, oh, this user can actually do this roundabout way and get access, or if they actually have access to something you don't realize right away, um, and that'll kind of go through, and if there's something that you don't see, you know, they can report it to you. So those are a few of the tools. Uh, there's other ones, too, or just kind of generally testing your machines, trying to use them and make sure that they work. For the competition, because um, usability is a pretty big part of it as well. That's really most of the stuff here from you know, beginners tonight concepts. So if you have any questions that are specific to anything in here or general that weren't touched on in this, uh, feel free to shout them out. These are some links, um, just kind of good practices. Slack is in here, in just general tutorials from Ice Age and things like that. Just if you don't know something, basically you just look up online and try to find an answer. And if you can't find an answer, ask somebody that you know is not addressed, someone that's part of ICH, and they'll probably help you. Uh, yeah. What time is the competition at? Yeah, so October 12th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. It's on the, the website, it just says the day. Okay, yeah. Uh, Red Team Attack Base starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 4 p.m. It's closed the day, like the Friday before or the afternoon, so it's set up times so you can go in there the night before and do like final preparation, things like that, to make sure it's all good. There's nothing else. That's, that's really all there was for this one. Uh, like I said, if you have any other questions, just reach out to the people and I'll help you out. Um, there's, reach out to the Slack here and I'll help you too. So.